This peripheral nervous system highlight screencast deals with spinal nerves. Recall that the peripheral nervous system consists of 12 cranial nerves and 36 spinal nerves in the dog and cat. Each spinal nerve is formed bilaterally by the union of dorsal and ventral spinal roots that attach to the spinal cord. A spinal nerve is located more or less within an intervertebral foramen formed by adjacent vertebrae. Spinal nerves and their branches are enveloped by connective tissue called epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium. In contrast, the spinal roots are enveloped by meninges that enclose the spinal cord as well as the spinal roots. This cartoon shows the connective tissue components that envelop a peripheral nerve, that is a spinal nerve or a cranial nerve or any of their branches. First of all, there is an epineurium that surrounds the collection of nerve fascicles that comprise the nerve. Each fascicle is surrounded by a fibrous perineum and by perineural epithelioid cells. Within a fascicle, endoneurium surrounds individual nerve fibers. Nerve fibers are composed of axons ensheathed or myelinated by neurolemocytes. Here we see two myelinated axons. The axons are myelinated by neurolemocytes. This image shows the spinal cord and the spinal roots enveloped by meninges colored blue here and here. Meninges are removed on this side. Here we can see that the spinal nerve, which is colored yellow, is formed by the union of a dorsal root and a ventral root. A spinal ganglion is evident on the dorsal root. The dorsal root contains afferent axons. The ventral root contains efferent axons. It is clinically significant that the intervertebral foramen through which the spinal nerve exits is located above the intervertebral disc composed of an annulus fibrosus and nucleus propulsus because herniation of disc material can impact the spinal nerve and cause clinical signs. This image shows one, two, three, four segments of spinal cord that are exposed by excising the dura mater. This is the cut edge of dura mater, as is this down here. The dura mater is the outer layer of meninges. Each spinal segment gives rise to bilateral spinal nerves here and here formed by the union of dorsal and ventral spinal roots. Each spinal root is composed of individual rootlets that all converge at the spinal nerve. On the dorsal rootlets, which is the surface we're looking at, a spinal ganglion is evident. Here it's labeled by this red marker. This is a drawing of a vertebral canal exposed by a laminectomy, that is a removal of laminae. The laminae are the tops of the roofs of the vertebral arches, and they've been removed by the laminectomy. Meninges have also been removed on the left side, but they've been retained on the right side, and here they're colored blue. Each spinal cord segment gives rise bilaterally to dorsal roots, which include a spinal ganglion on the dorsal root. The spinal nerve that is formed by the union of dorsal and ventral roots is short and located approximately within an intervertebral foramen. This image shows that the spinal cord and the dorsal and ventral roots are surrounded by meninges, dark gray. Each spinal nerve gives rise to four primary branches, primary in the sense that they are the first or the initial branches of a spinal nerve. 
One branch that is so small it requires magnification to dissect is the meningeal branch. It is sensory to the meninges. Meningitis, an inflammation of meninges, tends to be painful. And it is this meningeal branch that conveys that pain to the, through the spinal nerve to the spinal cord. Another branch, the ramus communicans, connects the spinal nerve with the sympathetic trunk. The two major branches of a spinal nerve are the dorsal branch and the ventral branch. Both branches have a full complement of nerve fiber types. Their only difference is the regions that they innervate. This image shows a thoracic spinal nerve. Notice the spinal roots and the ramus communicans going down to the sympathetic trunk. The two main branches are the dorsal branch and the ventral branch. The dorsal branch supplies epaxial muscles and it gives rise to a dorsal cutaneous nerve. The longer ventral branch is an intercostal nerve in this case. It innervates hypaxial muscles and gives rise to a lateral cutaneous nerve and eventually a small ventral cutaneous nerve. The lateral cutaneous nerve is, a, is significant in size. The ventral cutaneous nerve is quite small. This dissection shows an intercostal nerve. It and intercostal vessels run along the caudal surface of each rib. Spinal nerve branches have somewhat different patterns in different regions of the body. This image illustrates the dorsal and ventral branch patterns for four regions. The neck region, the thoracic region, the lumbar region, and the innervation to the limbs, which is via the brachial plexus for the thoracic limb or the lumbosacral plexus for the pelvic limb. Notice first that the spinal nerve and its roots and its dorsal and ventral branches are the same in all cases. Also, the dorsal branch always divides into a medial branch and a lateral branch. One difference is that the dorsal cutaneous nerve comes off the medial branch of the dorsal branch in the neck region, but elsewhere it comes off the lateral branch of the dorsal branch. And in the case of the spinal nerve segments that contributes to limbs, there is no dorsal cutaneous nerve. The ventral branch, however, is regionally variable. It's a, it always supplies hip axial muscles and it gives rise to one or two cutaneous nerves. The lateral cutaneous nerve in the thoracic and lumbar regions is, is a particularly significant series of nerves. In the case of limb innervation, ventral branches of spinal nerves immediately swap branches to create a brachial plexus for the thoracic limb and a lumbosacral plexus for the pelvic limb. Each plexus gives rise to main nerves that innervate the limb. This cartoon shows how the skin is innervated in the face, neck, in the trunk, and in the limbs from a surface viewpoint. The neck is supplied by a series of dorsal and ventral cutaneous nerves from respectively dorsal branches and ventral branches of cervical spinal nerves. The first in the series of ventral cutaneous nerves is larger than the others and is named. Its two branches are the great auricular nerve and the transverse cervical nerve. The remaining ventral branches are identified numerically. For example, the third cervical ventral cutaneous nerve. In the trunk, dorsal and lateral cutaneous nerves are significant. They are numbered T6, T7, etc., except for the very first, which may be called intercostal brachial, and the very last, which may be called the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve. The skin of the limbs is innervated by named branches of the named nerves that arise from the brachial or the lumbosacral plexus. For example, a superficial radial nerve, a 
medial cutaneous antibrachial nerve, a lateral cutaneous sural nerve, etc. The skin of the face is innervated by named branches of the trigeminal cranial nerve. This dissection shows the series of dorsal cutaneous nerves in a cat. The head is to the right, the tail is to the left, the midline is right along here. Notice that in the neck, the dorsal cutaneous nerves emerge from the midline. The reason is that the cutaneous nerves arise from medial branches of the dorsal branches of the cervical spinal nerve. Caudal to the neck, the dorsal cutaneous nerves come from the lateral branches of the dorsal branches of the spinal nerve. This dissection of the thorax shows the series of dorsal cutaneous nerves and below a series of lateral cutaneous nerves. This from dorsal branches of spinal nerves and this from ventral branches of spinal nerves. Uh, also evident is a lateral thoracic nerve that comes from the brachial plexus and innervates cutaneous trunchi muscle. Limbs are innervated by nerve plexuses. The thoracic limb is innervated by the brachial plexus. The pelvic limb is innervated by the lumbosacral plexus. The reason for the nerve plexus has to do with the fact that individual muscles are formed by multiple myotomes. Typical limb muscles are formed by the fusion of three myotomes. That means that each muscle must be innervated by three spinal nerves. But limb muscles are supplied by named regional nerves such as the femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, the sciatic nerve. Thus the limb plexus enables each regional nerve to receive axons from multiple ventral branches. In contrast, the muscles of the trunk are broad. They receive ventral branch innervation directly by independent ventral branches. This dissection shows the transversus abdominis muscle being innervated by multiple ventral branches of spinal nerves. For example, this is T12, T13, L1, L2, L3. This image shows the brachial plexus. It is formed by ventral branches of C6, C7, C8, and T1 spinal nerves. Named regional nerves emerge from the plexus. Each nerve, for example, the ulna, median, and musculocutaneous nerves, contains axons from multiple spinal nerves. This cartoon of the pelvic limb shows named nerves like cranial, gluteal, femoral, obturator, sciatic, tibial, and peroneal or fibular, innervating different regions of the limb. Each of these regional nerves has to contain axons from typically three spinal nerves because the muscles that they innervate were formed by merger of three myotomes. One possible way to innervate limb muscles would be to send independent ventral branches to each muscle. So each muscle would be receiving three segments via independent branches. In other words, innervate limb muscles the same way that trunk muscles are innervated by independent ventral branches. But this approach did not survive evolution. Presumably, thin, delicate nerves were too vulnerable to survive. In other words, nature solved the in limb innovation problem by creating plexuses and thicker regional nerves. This cartoon shows three versions of the canine lumbosacral plexus. It is intended to show that limb plexes exhibit anatomical variation in terms of the cranial caudal segmental contributions to regional nerves. For example, if we focus on the femoral nerve, we see that in a typical plexus, it receives contributions from L6, L5, and L4. But in some cases where the plexus is regarded as prefixed, L4 contributes more to the femoral nerve, while L6 contributes less or none. In other cases, the opposite occurs. 
So in the postfix variation of the plexus, L6 contributes more than L4 does to the formation of the femoral nerve. The point is that there is a range of plexus variability among dogs, although most dogs will exhibit uh, this typical plexus arrangement. This dissection shows the lumbosacral plexus of a cat. The plexus is fed by ventral branches of spinal nerves. This is S3, S2, S1, L7 is here, this is L6. Here on the other side, S3, S2, S1, L7, and L6 are evident. This is the femoral nerve. This is the obturated nerve. It's been broken. This would be the sciatic nerve. Uh, this would be pudendal nerve. And here, this little stump coming off is the pelvic nerve that's carrying parasympathetic preganglionic axons to the pelvic plexus, as well as visceral afferents from pelvic viscera. All of the spinal nerves and their dorsal and ventral major branches contain four fiber types. Two are afferent, general somatic afferent to skin, muscles, tendons, and joints, and general visceral afferent to walls of blood vessels in skin and muscles. They also contain two kinds of efferent axons. Somatic efferent innervates skeletal muscle, whereas visceral efferent innervate viscera, namely cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and gland. Visceral efferent neurons are autonomic. This cartoon shows the spinal nerve and three of its four primary branches, the dorsal branch, the ventral branch, and the communicating branch, or ramus communicans. The spinal nerve and its dorsal branch and ventral branch contain all four of the fiber types, the somatic efferent, visceral efferent, the general somatic afferent, and the general visceral afferent. The ramus communicans contains preganglionic visceral efferent axons going to sympathetic trunk ganglia and postganglionics from those autonomic ganglia that travel back up the ramus communicans and then run out with the ventral branch or out with the dorsal branch to get to, for example, smooth muscle of blood vessels in skeletal muscles and in skin. The ramus communicans can also convey general visceral afferents from viscera. All the afferent axons enter the spinal cord by running through the dorsal root. And they have uni the afferents have unipolar cell bodies then in spinal ganglia which are located on the dorsal roots. The, e the ventral roots convey efferent axons to the spinal nerve. So afferent and efferents are mixed in the spinal nerve and its branches, but there's a segregation in the roots. The dorsal root is afferent and the ventral root is efferent. This concludes the spinal nerves section of the peripheral nervous system highlights screencast.